glad in it. God has given us a new day every day to worship him in, to experience his mercies, for the mercies of God are new every morning. Amen. Let's open up with a word of prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to worship and to share from your word this morning. We ask that you move upon our hearts and upon our spirits and draw us close unto you. Lord, we know the work that you began within us, you're going to bring about to completion. And Lord, we're excited for what you have in store for us, for using the gifts of the Spirit on a daily basis in and through our lives as we open up our hearts and our spirits to, to uh, well, to unite with you, Father, to partner with you to reach this world. So, Lord, take captive every thought that's been going through our mind and help us to focus it on you, your word. We ask you change us. Don't let us leave here the same as we came in. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Until you breathe, my heart came alive, came alive for the first time. As a prisoner, I'm free. I feel so alive, so alive for the first time. I feel so alive, so alive. Oh 
the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Thank you. 
are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. Touching every heart, I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you.
that is indeed who you are. You've done miracles in our hearts and our lives. You brought us through things that we never thought would be possible. Some of us have battled cancer, Father, and you've brought us through and you've seen us victorious over that. You've healed us. You've delivered us from bondages in our hearts and our lives, Father, that had such control over us that you broke the chains and set us free. You've provided ways where there seemed to be no way. No way through our temptation. No way through that mountain, that obstacle in our way, but yet you provided for us. You are Jehovah Jireh, the Lord God that provides. Lord, you promise to never leave us nor forsake us. You promised to be with us. Even in the good days, but also in the bad. Help us to remember, Father, that when we're overwhelmed, when we feel that the enemy has totally surrounded us, help us not to throw in the towel and quit. Help us to hang in there, Father, realizing that you are surrounding your children, that you are there protecting us, that you are there fighting for us. For the battle belongs to you, O oh Lord. The weapons of our warfare are not the things of this world the sword of the spirit the breastplate of righteousness that comes from a relationship with you the helmet of salvation realizing that you're the one that saved us and you that saved us that brought us into a relationship with you are not going to leave us for putting the belt of truth around our waist the truth of your word the truth that we need to apply in our lives the truth that holds everything together. Your word that prepares our feet to take the gospel of peace to this world. Help us to be a light in this world of darkness, Father. The world can be overwhelming, but nothing is impossible with you. you are for us, Father, who, who can be against us? We are your children, co-heirs with Jesus. Help us to take our stand, and having done all, Father, to stand. Now, Lord, we ask you to just open up our hearts to receive your truth. Open up our eyes that we might see your truth and respond to it. And hide it in our hearts. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, you know what? This weekend is a special weekend. Not only are we here in God's house, but it's Liz's birthday this weekend. Yeah. She probably didn't want me to point that out, but it is for her birthday. <laughs> After service, we are going to have some cake and celebrate with her. But while she's sitting here in the service, we're going to sing happy birthday to her. You know it's a bluegrass style, right? Bluegrass style. <laughs> hey, I'll follow along with whatever you happy do. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to Happy birthday to you. <laughs> You can throw your hats in the air now. <laughs> Amen. Well, today is a great day, and 
You know, I don't say too much about offering, but I just want to encourage you to uh, continue to be faithful because as you are faithful, God enables us to do great things in reaching our community. And God has been so faithful to this little church. We've put in new furnaces. We put in the new roof at the parsonage this year and all in cash. That means we've not had to go to the bank to borrow anything. And that's just simply because you're faithful with God and whatever he puts on your heart to give that you give. And I just want to say thank you. If you're wondering where to put it, uh, you don't see the offering plate going around. It's at the door going out and enough said. Amen. That's one of the few times that I'll say anything. But, you know, God has been so faithful. I just want to say thank you. Now, we do have a couple precious special projects coming up, and you're going to hear about those. Um, one involves adding security to the church and installing a video uh, surveillance system and things like that that's being required by our insurance. Um, it's just safety factor, amen? It's just a safety factor in today's world. So uh, you'll hear more about that in the coming days ahead as we get closer to that happening. Amen. Open up your Bibles this morning to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Actually, we're going to be all over the place, so uh, that's going to be our main text. But uh, last week, we started a new series about the spiritual gifts and how they apply to our lives and how we can use them and what they are. We lear first learned that the Corinthian church was in turmoil. In fact, they were in danger of ripping apart physically. That, that church was literally coming apart. There was a lot of infighting. They were saying that one person's gifts was more important than another person's gift. And uh, they were causing disruption in the service so much that they never even got around to the preaching of the word. Everyone was just using their gifts. And there was no order in the church at all. And we learned that there's four dangers last week about the gifts of the Spirit being used in the church. And the first danger was that as being ignorant of the church, of the, of the gifts, not knowing that those gifts are even here, um, that there are gifts that God wants to give to his children. We learned, secondly, that the danger of being carried away to false worship and how people can uh, uh, open themselves up to, to Satan, to their own uh, personal views, and try to manipulate or manufacture a gift of the Spirit, talking in a word of prophecy, making it up off the top of their head so that people look at them and, and uh, put them on a high pedestal. But we always need to, uh, what's the word, to check those things with the Word of God. The Word of God is always our foundation. God will never say anything that will go against His Word. Amen? That's why we need to know God's Word. We need to hide His Word in our heart. We know that also that there's a danger of speaking false messages and false worship, like I just mentioned. The fourth was the danger of speaking without the guidance of the Holy Spirit. In other words, doing it in our human uh, nature. So without any further ado with that, let's jump into today's message and talk about the gifts of the Spirit, part two. Now, you know, in this world today, people in the Christian world even, who pref are professing either through word or deed that the gifts of the Spirit are not necessary in today's services. I don't know if you're aware of that, but it's very true. Even in the assemblies of God, you'll find churches that don't allow the gifts of the Spirit to move. And they think that, well, they're, they're trying to, and I understand their concern for the new believer, a new person that comes in off the street. They don't want to offend them. So they limit the gifts of the Spirit being used in service. But we're told in the Word of God that the gifts of the Spirit are not necessarily for the believer, but for the unbeliever. It's to be a sign to them that God is here in this place, that God is working. 
And it's something that would draw them into a relationship with Jesus. And I'm here today to say to you that God the Father has given us the Holy Spirit. He has given us these gifts for a purpose. He's given us all nine gifts of the Spirit, and these gifts are part of the Spirit. Look at John chapter 14, verse 16. It says, and I will ask the Father, this is Jesus speaking. He says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Who is that helper? The helper is the Holy Spirit. And he says so as you continue down in verse 26 of that same chapter 14. He says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. All that I've said to you. We commit, we commit a measure of irreverence when we consider something that God has given us for our benefit to be of little or no value. We commit irreverence when we do that. Let me say it this way. Sometimes we take our salvation for granted. And we count it as little, if anything. And we take advantage of it. And part of that is irreverence to God when we do that. If we don't keep him first in our hearts and our lives. Timothy was a young pastor. And it says that he became negligent of the exercise of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the Apostle Paul had to exhort him, to encourage him, not to neglect the gift that he had. Look at Timothy chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. He says, Do not neglect the gift that you have, which was given to you by prophecy, when the council of elders laid their hands on you, practice these things, immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so you will save both yourself and your hearers. Now, I don't believe that Timothy had scorned the gifts of the Spirit or the use of them in church. I don't believe that he was holding them down and not allowing them to be used on purpose. I think he just got busy, like you and I get busy, working for the Lord, and thought that we were getting along just fine without the precious manifestations of heaven. Everything was going smoothly. Just like it's been going smoothly here for the last couple of years. And we've not seen a physical manifestation of the Holy Spirit, of the gifts in our service. But yet they are there. We're just not seeing them in the way that we expect to see them. Now in the 80s, you saw the Spirit moving like crazy. I remember sitting in a service when I first came to the Lord and I sat in uh, like the fourth pew back on the left side. Uh, as uh, well, my left as I'm facing the congregation, but I was sitting there and along came that stillness as we were singing, it just kind of an awe came across the crowd. And one brother all of a sudden started at the top of his lungs speaking in tongues, scared the daylights out of me because he was right behind me. I thought I was in a demon worshiping service. I really did. I didn't know anything about the gifts of the Spirit. I had never heard about the Holy Spirit. And the pastor got up and said, what you've just seen is a moving of the Spirit as recorded in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That caused me to want to find out more about the Holy Spirit. Or is what they're saying is true. And I looked it up in the Word of God, and sure enough, it was there. I said, well, what is this Holy Spirit? It's, it's, I knew that there's Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but I didn't know about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 
I began to read every verse that I could find in the Bible about the Holy Spirit. I went to the Christian bookstore and I was buying every book I could find on the gifts of the Spirit because I wanted to find out if this thing is true. Is there something more to Christianity than just committing our life to him? Is there something more that I'm missing? And I found that, yes, there was. I needed the Holy Spirit to be baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, receiving my own prayer language, allowing God to use the gifts in my life. After that, I began to go to the altar every time we have opened up the doors for service. On Sundays, on Wednesdays, any chance I had, I would go to early morning prayer. We had a special prayer room that they had a door to the outside that we could come into, and I would go in there and pray before work, and I sought the Holy Spirit. I bawled and squalled, but nothing happened. And maybe you've been there too. You've been seeking the gifts of the Spirit, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it hasn't come yet. That's okay. Just keep seeking. He says, if you seek, you'll find. If you knock, the door will be opened unto you. Right? So we just need to keep seeking. God's word says, how much more will he give the Holy Spirit to those that ask? So what we need to do is keep asking. Don't give up. Keep asking. And he will. Give us the Holy Spirit. One night I was just laying in my bed, going to sleep, praying as I always do, asking God to bless our family, to heal those who are sick and those that were called to my memory from church. And I said, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, I had these sounds going through my head. Now, to me, initially, it sounded like a bunch of baby talk. I couldn't make heads or tails of it. And as I was hearing it in my, in my head, I just began to speak it out. And the first thing that happened is the enemy, myself, came up and said, this is not the Holy Spirit. This is just you. I said, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. I asked for the Holy Spirit. He said he would give me the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, I'm hearing this language that I've never learned, I've never studied. And it sounded like words. It, it was phrased like words as I was speaking it out loud. And then I, the thought came to my mind. I said, Lord, you know what? I'm not sure if this is the Holy Spirit or not. But I'm going to take a step of faith. And I want you to know that as I speak these words, I'm praising you. And it's like all of a sudden, the floodgates of heaven just opened up. And it's like I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop speaking. In fact, it was hard to speak in English. I went to work the next afternoon. I worked at a graveyard shift. And uh, the, the spirit was just there with me. I, I, people would come in to check, check in, and the first thing I would say is something in this heavenly language. <laughs> and I'd quickly catch myself and uh, say, you know, say welcome and uh, glad to see you, those types of things. In the morning when the workers came in, they would start asking me a question. I'd turn around and answer them in the spirit. And they said, huh? I said, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you know. I didn't explain it to them because I didn't have any way of explaining at that point. I was a newbie. I was a new kid in the Holy Spirit. But that's what the spirit does. He gives you a boldness. He just comes upon you in strength and power, and you just you just know. you got to take that step of faith. You have to seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. Ask, 
and you receive. Like salvation, we cannot escape judgment if we neglect or ignore our spiritual life. Let me say that again. Like salvation, we cannot escape judgment if we neglect or ignore our spiritual life. If we don't, on a daily basis, read our word, spend time in prayer, and I mean more than five minutes in prayer saying, God bless me, thank you for having me, seeing me through this day, and, and you know, heal those that are sick in my family, and off to bed we go. We need to really spend time in prayer letting him speak to us. That means blocking our lips, allowing God to speak to us. And that's the hardest thing we can do because we love the sound of our voice, don't we? We love talking. But we need to let God speak to us. And if we neglect our spiritual growth, if we don't spend time in the Word, if we don't spend time reading and looking up scriptures and hiding them in our heart, then we become weak as Christians. Without the gifts of the Spirit, we are left all too often with, I hope so, prayers. Because we really don't know if God's going to answer our prayers or not. The ministry of the gifts of the Spirit will help to begin to fulfill our airship with Jesus. I'm not talking about an airship up in the air. I'm talking about an airship, a inheritance, a co-heir with Christ Jesus, as it says in God's word. And as we do, we begin acting in power like the children of God that God has called us to be. Look at Romans chapter 8, verses 16 through 17. It says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. How do you know that you're saved? Well, you just know that you know that you know. Why? Because God's word says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, we shall be saved. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, we have a relationship with God. If we've done those things, we are co-heirs with Christ Jesus of all the things of God the Father in heaven. And when we get to heaven, we will have all those things. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, verse 17, look at that. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we also be glorified with him. Now, that's a thing that we like to just kind of gloss over. We want all the benefits of God, but we don't want to have to suffer. We don't want to have to work. We don't want to do the things that God's asking us to do. And sometimes we will suffer for Christ. People will persecute us revile against us, say all manner of evil against us. That's what Jesus even said. And he said, they're not persecuting you, they're persecuting who? Him who's within us. It's through the powers of the Spirit, through the gifts of the Spirit, that we also experience John chapter 14, verse 12. And here Jesus said this, He said, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do. Why? Because he goes to the Father. We also experience Mark chapter 16, verses 16 through 18. It says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, and whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. The loving Lord Jesus Christ and devotion to his word must accompany the use of the gifts of the spirit. Loving Jesus And giving devotion to his word must accompany the gifts of the Spirit. That's why when we're reading through Corinthians, Paul devotes 
several chapters just to the gifts of the Spirit. And he lists the gifts of the Spirit in chapter 12, and right after that, he gives us chapter 13, which is called the love chapter. If we do all these gifts and signs and wonders in our own physical nature without the love of Christ, we are failing. We must have a foundation of love, the love of God in our lives. We lack knowledge. We lack knowledge to properly carry out the will of God. Paul reminds us that we often do not even know how to pray and that the Holy Spirit must pray through us. That's why when we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, the evidence of knowing that you are baptized in the Spirit is speaking in tongues, speaking in this new language. It says right here, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. He says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what we need to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Have you ever been there? Where you're praying and God is, you, you sense his presence there, but you just don't know what to pray for, but you feel a heaviness upon you that you need to pray. Or we're praying for an answer to a situation in our lives, and we're praying and we're praying, and we just run out of words. We don't know what to, to pray for. And that's why he gives us the tongues to pray in, to pray in the Spirit. Because it's God's Spirit within us. When we become Christians, God's Spirit takes residence within us, right? And when he takes residence within us, he's... He's, he's everywhere. He's inside of us. He's in the world. He's in heaven. He's everywhere. And he knows what we need. In fact, it says in the word of God that he knows what our needs are be, and sends the answers before we even ask for them. That being true, when we don't know what to pray for, the Spirit says, well, I do. I know what to pray for. And as we allow the Spirit to move in our hearts and our lives, and we pray in that heavenly language, then He hears, understands, and answers. We are promised that the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon us when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea, and Samaria to the end of the earth. Yet too, well, all too many of us, the power lies dormant and unused in us because the gifts of the Spirit by which much of the power is released are not permitted to be in operation. Whether it's not permitted in churches that we're attending or we just flat out don't allow God to move in our heart and allow the gifts of the Spirit to move. I know it's nerve-wracking to take that step of faith when God's speaking to you at that moment in the service. I remember the first time I gave an interpretation of tongues. I was sitting in the choir. We just sang a moving, stirring song, and we we're, were waiting on the Spirit. I sit in, on the, the platform, a couple rows back. I was on the end. And the Spirit of God was there. I sensed him so strongly upon me that literally I, 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 I had the interpretation, but I wasn't about to speak it. I had never done that. And the longer I held on to it, longer I felt God urging, urging more and more, speak, speak. I said, uh-uh, I ain't going to do it. It's just me. And before I knew it, I was shaking, and, 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 and I said, okay, and I began to speak it out. After I spoke it, it's like, Phew. But that initial hesitancy of, okay. What did I just say? 
<laughs> patience, yes. <laughs> None of us have that patience sometimes, do we? But God moved. And everybody that heard it, what did they do? They evaluated what I said with the word of God. If it goes against God's word, it's not of God. If it is, then we receive the word of God. And how do we receive it? Many of them would start saying, thank you, Jesus. Some would clap their hands. Thank you, Lord. That's how we receive it. And we acknowledge that, yes, we believe that that's the word of God. That's the word of God speaking unto us. Now, at least last week, I said this one comment, and, and some people probably thought I was a little crazy for it. But here, I believe that it's more important to see God in the gifts than the gifts in the people. Okay? It's more important to see the God in the gifts than the gifts in the people. God wants to move in our hearts. He wants to use the gifts of the Spirit in us. But he wants to see his will done. He wants to see his word sent forth. He wants to see people drawn into salvation with him. That's the purpose of the gifts of the Spirit, is to draw men, women, children into a personal relationship with him. And yet too many of us allow this power to lie dormant and unused in our lives. In the fifth book, in the fifth chapter of Acts, there's a story about this Christian couple. And they become very cardinal, very worldly, and they agree to lie about the extent of their giving to the Lord Jesus. And by the gifts of the Spirit working through the Apostle Peter, their wickedness is brought out into the open and judged. Look with me over in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 11. It says, but a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, let me give you a little background. The people were believing that God was moving in their midst, and they were the mission of God was heavy on their heart. And to accomplish that, they were giving everything. In fact, they were, they were selling everything to give to God, and they were living kind of in a... Uh, communal type situation where they were using everything for the benefit of everyone. Now, Ananias and Sapphira did not have to give everything that they sold. That was their choice. But they wanted to hide it from the apostles that they were holding anything back. In other words, they were wanting to try out the Christian community, and just in case things don't work out, they wanted some in the bank to fall back on. That's what was going on. And here it says that they had planned together to give only a part of it and lay it at the apostles' feet. Verse 3. But when they laid it at his feet, it says this, But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. And while it remained unsold, did not you not remain? Did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You've not lied to man, but you've lied to God. And when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard it. In other words, he died. And it says, very next part of that verse, a great fear came upon all who heard it. Now, yeah, that would be great fear for us too, wouldn't it? If we were giving the offering and we said that we sold this piece of land and we only gave part of it and we said we gave all of it, 
And it was supernaturally revealed to the leader. In this case, it was Peter that that had been done, and he confronted him. And the person that gave fell down dead on the spot. That would stir us up a little bit. That would put a little fear within us. A fear of, well, I'm not going to lie to God. I'm going to do what I tell him that I'm going to do. Notice what happened in verse 6. It says that the young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. And after an interval of about three hours, his wife comes in, not knowing what had happened. So she comes in and to fellowship with the believers. And what happens? Peter comes up to her and says, hey, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yeah, we did. Verse 9, but Peter said to it, how is it that you've agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. And immediately what happened? She fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead. They carried her out and buried her next to her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. Now, here in this story, we see at least three gifts of the Spirit being used. We see the discerning of spirits. These are in your notes. You see the discerning of spirits. For Peter knew that the Spirit, that Satan had filled their hearts to lie to the Holy Spirit. In other words, they had a lying spirit. Acts chapter 5, verse 3. We also see the gift of the word of knowledge. Peter knew supernaturally. It's not something that he discovered on a receipt somewhere. Someone didn't whisper it in his ear. It was the Holy Spirit supernaturally telling him that they had not given the full price of the land as they professed to be doing. Also, Acts chapter 5, verse 3. And then we see the working of miracles. At the prompting of the Holy Spirit, Peter announced the deaths of both Ananias and Sapphira, and what happened? They died immediately. You see, the result of this unusual display of God's power was a new sense of reverence and godly fear. People became afraid to play church. And they served the Lord with fervor, with fire and sincerity. But let's look at the rest of the story. Acts chapter 5, verse 11 through 16. And it says, and great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared to join them. In other words, other non-Christians, they were afraid to join the church. They didn't know what was happening. They had a fear of God. But the people, it says, held them, who's them? Christians in high esteem. Christians had a great reputation. And it says, and more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. So what was the result of the, the deaths of Ananias and Sapphira, the, the using of the gifts of the Spirit? It resulted in multitudes of both men and women coming to know Jesus Christ. Verse 15, so they even carried out the sick into the streets, laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least a shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Now in these verses, we see at least seven aspects of church growth that directly resulted from the use of the gifts of the Spirit here in Acts chapter 5. The first one is this, fear came upon Christians. They were afraid to pretend about being spiritual anymore. And that's what we need to do. We need to quit playing church. We need to live out our Christianity. We need to live out our relationship with God. And that means we need to live out the gifts of the Spirit in our lives. That's what they're there for. 
Number two, the people outside the church who heard what had happened had a new reverence for God, the God of these people. People not only had a fear of God, but they had a reverent fear of God. They knew that God was real. Third, the apostles and the people had a greater faith for miracles. It says that they went out and what did they do? They healed the sick. They cast out demons. And it says that they were all healed, right? People brought them so that even the shadow of Peter would fall on them. He didn't even have to touch them. He didn't have to pray. He didn't have to do anything. Just let his shadow touch them. And they believed that God would heal them. Fourthly, there was a new unity among the saints. They feared the wrath of God and upon a church quarrel. <laughs> it brought healing in the community. Number five, unsaved people were afraid to join the church unless they were really saved with a changed heart. They just didn't come down and give their heart to God because their boyfriend or girlfriend or the person that they were going to marry was a Christian. They didn't do it to get a better job. They were afraid to come and give their life to God unless they were really changed in heart. And that's how we know that a person has really given their heart to God, that they've really given their life to him, is that they live a changed life. That so they're not the same as they walked in. And I pray that that happens with each and every one of us, that we will be changed, even as Christians, from the way that we walked in today than when we walk out those doors this afternoon. We want to be changed. We want to be molded into the image of God. Number six, born-again believers had a higher, more respected reputation in the city. They didn't look down at the Christians, but there was a higher reputation there was more respect given to them. It was known that their God would not tolerate hypocrisy. Number seven, more people were convicted of their sin than ever before, and they were genuinely converted to Christianity. Now, my friends, every church could use that kind of a revival. Amen. The gifts of the Spirit are designed to draw men's heart to the Creator God who is behind them. The Corinthian church, however, and church, uh, Paul char started a lot of churches, Corinth being one of them. Um, well, the Corinth church was really a worldly church, started in a worldly church pagan place, a place that people lived immorally, had many gods. But Paul preached the word of God with a demonstration of power. The signs followed him. Now, let me ask you this question. Where is a preacher, a pastor, that doesn't want to see a crowd? We all want to see a crowd. I want to see this church filled. I want to see it overflowing. And many churches will use every method, every gimmick imaginable to try to draw people into churches. Why? Because they want to be able to boast of a certain number. But that's not me. I sincerely believe that most of our special services, our events, our special speakers have only one purpose. And that one purpose is this, is to expose people to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want people to hear what God is doing in other parts of the country, changing hearts, changing lives, and setting people free. We want to win souls for Jesus. Amen. And that's what the demonstration of the power of the Spirit is all about. 
We need to let our ministry and our church be characterized by the supernatural from heaven. And people will begin to attend simply out of curiosity and, and, and a hunger for God. When a lame man was healed, when Peter and John were going up at the hour of prayer, as we read over in Acts chapter 3, verses 11 to 12, it says, while they, 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 they looked at him and, and uh, they said, hey, to so this lame beggar who was laid from his birth at the gate beautiful, it says, we learn as we're reading it there, he was old. He's only about 39, I believe. Now, that doesn't sound old to us. But back then, that was a senior citizen. Okay? You didn't have a long expectancy in life. He had been there for year after year after year, laid at the gate beautiful, begging from offerings as people went up to the prayer at the temple. And Peter and John looked at him and said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as we have we are giving unto you. And they said, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And they took him by the hand. They expected God to move. They expected the young man to be healed. And they took him by the hand and lifted him up. And what happened? He began to walk. He didn't just walk. It says that he went walking and leaping. There was a miracle that took place right then and there. And it says, verse 11, Acts chapter 3, while he clung to Peter and John, who wouldn't cling to Peter and John, they just healed you. Really, it wasn't them. It was Jesus working through them and the gifts of the Spirit. It says that all the people utterly astounded, I love those words, utterly astounded, ran together to them at the portico in Solomon's temple. Think about that. People were so amazed that they reacted in such a way that they didn't walk to the temple. They didn't just fast walk to the temple. They literally ran. It's like people running to the altar of God because they see God moving in the midst of his people, and they want a piece of that. They want to be changed. They want to see God working in their hearts, and they're not afraid to go and answer the call of God in their life. They want to be changed. And they're saying, I don't want to miss out. It says that they ran to the portico called Solomon's. Verse 12, and when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Why do you stare at us? As though by our own power or piety, we've made him walk. In other words, they're saying, it's not us. This is Jesus. Well, let's skip now down to verse chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. And it says, as they were speaking, as he's still talking to them, saying, why do you not, why are you thinking that it's us? He says, as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. And greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus, the resurrection from the dead, they arrested them and put them into custody until the next day, for it was already evening. So they arrested Peter and John. But notice this in verse 4. It says, but many of those who heard the word believed. Many of those that heard Peter and John speaking, even though they were arrested, believed on Jesus Christ. And it says the number of men came to 5,000. 5,000 people were saved that day. Why? Because of the healing of the lame man. They saw it happen. They knew that that lame man had been there for year after year. They saw him every day they went to the temple. And they're in the outer courts out there. And they saw him healed and Peter and John talking about it. And they responded to God's word. And 5,000 men came to God. Now, it's doubtful that Peter and John could have gotten this attention by any special music, any special preaching that somebody did. And even if they had, it's extremely doubtful that so many people would have been convinced 
and convicted of the argument of preaching alone. In other words, if I went out and I spoke in a stadium, no matter how many people were filled in there, it's not likely that 5,000 would be saved just because of my eloquent preaching. Not because I'm such a good speaker. Not because I tell such good stories. Not because our great worship team up here led a great worship and moving, uh, allowing the Spirit to move in our midst. People, yes, will respond sometimes, but you're not going to get that type of a crowd simply by those things. 